I'm pleased to uh, introduce Tom Bianchi, who holds the John and Beverly Thompson Endowed Chair of Geological Sciences in the Department of Geological Sciences, University of Florida now. He previously held an endowed chair at Texas A&M University. And uh, he was also a professor at Tulane University, but I guess he got blown out of there by one of the many storms that come into the Gulf. In any case, uh, Tom's a, a widely recognized and internationally honored expert on carbon cycling in the world's oceans and in the earth generally. He is a, uh, he's a fellow of the Geochemical Society, the European Society of Geochemistry, ASLO, and American Geophysical Union. So he seems to be a fellow of virtually everything uh, that's available. And um, he is the author of over 240 papers. I noted that one of the papers has 125 co-authors, which uh, definitely <laughs> beats, beats anything that I've ever been a part of. Quite remarkable. I'd love to be on such a paper and be the very last author. Uh, that, that's sort of a goal. But in any case, he's also the author or editor of eight major books in biogeochemistry including uh, one on the biogeochemistry of the Gulf of Mexico, where he's done a lot of uh, work uh, previously. And uh, Tom was, if, for those of you who don't already know it, he actually got a master's degree from Stony Brook studying with Jeff Leventon in the Department of Ecology and Evolution. So he's in many ways coming home here and uh, we're delighted to welcome him. And uh, so now he'll present his, his uh, seminar on carbon processes in aquatic critical zones, and he will be available to answer questions afterwards. So Tom, welcome. Thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here today. And um, as I was saying before, it's, it's it's so nice to see people that were so important to me in my career and my life in general. Just a uh, uh, very sentimental trip back to see you folks. Um, so I'll be talking today about the um, carbon processing in what I call these aquatic uh, critical zones and um, some of what I consider to be some challenges and so on in the 21st century and some nuances in um, ways of approaching things. I'll talk to you about a variety of different projects funded by different agencies as we typically have to share with folks and, um, and of course um, these are the many people that um, this is their data that I'll be talking about, different postdocs and graduate students over the years um, and where they've gone. Um, so um, it's really all their work and I'm a bystander. Um, so the, the outline goes something like this. We'll talk a little bit about the global carbon budgets, uh, just some generalizations and I'll work through some of those sort of generalized slides first. Um, and then we'll go into how I, I think things are changing and how uh, we, we're certainly all aware of how the Anthropocene is upon us and, and modifying things. But um, these are some, some, perhaps some other different trends uh, you may have or may not have thought about. And then the, the last one will be um, related to a paper that actually Jeff and Bob and I uh, uh, have a number of other authors on, not quite 120 something yet, but, um, but a number of people. And it has to do with, 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 with migrations of organisms. Um, this is one particular example. I'm not going to get into the broader picture that that paper gets into, but this has to do with marshes and mangroves. And it's some work we've been doing in Texas and Florida. So, so the first uh, topic is um, sort of the general budgets. Let me just give myself the laser. Okay, so um, I'll start off uh, with some of the early budgets uh, from John Hedges and in, 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 these are in teragrams. And so you can see where, uh, of course, Benner, uh, Berner started to look at this even earlier uh, in, uh, than the 90s here, but this just sort of picks it up uh, from Hedges where you start looking at the uh, coastal margin and where the burial is occurring, the hotspots of burial. And so you can see deltaic sediments are a big number here. Um, 
And as you start moving to uh, a number of years later, Burdage did another sort of reassessment of the, the budgets and um, looks at deltaic sediments, non-deltaic, uh, all continental margins and so on. And again, um, you can see he's now divided uh, the sediments into to sort of the non-deltaic and the deltaic, with the deltaic still playing a big number uh, in, the, in the sort of the, the global picture of coastal margin. Um, I had a student who, who worked on adding another twist to this sort of developing uh, history of, of budgets for uh, burial sediments in the, in the global ocean. And you can see this one added here, uh, the fjords, um, turns out to be a much larger number than, than we had imagined. I mean, Svitsky and others had looked at this some years back. It's not new in that regard, but I'll talk a little bit about that later and, and talk about uh, a number of these different pools uh, of carbon and where they get buried and how we're shifting that around. So this is just a very, very quick preview of um, some of the longer historical work that's been going on for years. So just as a, a refresher, and I'm sure um, Stony Brook people do not need to be reminded of this with the scholars you have there, but again, just as, so we get on the same page, um, basically, you know, most of the carbon buried in oceanic sediments is within the coastal margin. Uh, this makes reference to that previous paper that I was mentioning um, that uh, gets cited when we talk about the importance of uh, of coastal margin burial. So why is this? Well, sedimentation rate is one important factor. Uh, redox, um, changing redox or low oxygen conditions because of high primary production. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done, uh, again, from Hedges, Larry Mayer, and many other people on the association of minerals. We'll talk about all of these things in different ways throughout the uh, uh, this sort of global uh, view. Um, uh, selective preservation that is just based on the, the organic composition of the organic matter itself. Geopolymerization, this is something that is actually not um, as a result of the machinery of what genes are producing uh, in terms of biosynthetic pathways in cells. This is actually where you can have organic matter that is linking post-depositionally outside the cell. And so these are, are things, some sort of condensation reactions, variety of other types of things that can also make uh, organic matter difficult to break down. And then I'll also talk a little bit about the role of iron, which has been getting lots of attention uh, in recent years in terms of uh, its role in, in, in carbon burial. Um, so if you look at um, some of the source sink questions that have come up uh, with respect, of course, to the role of, of this uh, hotspot for burial, that is the coastal margin, how does it play into uh, the importance of, of serving uh, as a sink potentially for the problems we're having with global warming? Well, if you look, this is a very busy uh, picture here, but you can see this is pre-industrial continental shelf. This is present day continental shelf. Uh, and essentially, um, the, the general story is that um, the pre-industrial uh, prior uh, to the introduction of, um, of um, many of the nutrients that eutrophied a lot of the coastal waters, we had a lot of CO2 coming out. Uh, present day, uh, a lot of this becomes more of a sink because of generally uh, the eutrophication of our coastal waters. Now, is that true for all coastal waters? No. Uh, of course, there's lots of variability, which is always the problem doing estuarine or coastal work compared to open ocean work. It's very heterogeneous, but this again is just sort of a general mindset of, of sort of pre-post-industrial changes and source sink ideas. Um, there's a lot more in that figure I won't go into. This is some new work that we've also been getting at to try to get some better feel for uh, the variability in, in, in very complex systems like, like coastal estuaries. And so we went through uh, basically um, the typology of all of these different types of estuaries and used a lot of data and modeling to come up with sort of some general numbers of deposition and burial rate. This is a new paper that was out. Um, and um, 
And so again, you know, if you look at the IPCC uh, recent reports over the past few years, with, there's still a big gap in understanding the coastal carbon burial. Uh, despite the fact that we know so much of it is there. And some of it is is somehow uh, getting people to listen more about that, and some of it is the problem simply of the heterogeneity. So this is just a little bit about what we've kind of done in, with respect to um, uh, that issue. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the aquatic uh, continuum. And uh, as many of you know, this sort of begins uh, in the mountains and the watersheds and moves through the floodplains and out uh, it may be a delta, it may not be, it may be a non-deltaic region, uh, whatever that may be, but uh, the point is that uh, within this particular uh, continuum, there's been lots of changes in what I'm going to talk about as these um, aquatic critical zones and how these things have changed uh, in the Anthropocene. One example would be dams, uh, but there are many, many uh, 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 changes that have occurred that, that affect where carbon gets buried and where it gets returned to the atmosphere. So this is one of my favorite figures that I use all the time from Professor Aller. Um, this is, um, as you move your way through the aquatic continuum to the coastline, uh, this particular figure very nicely brings in sort of the broader spectrum of uh, margin type. Uh, and it really hadn't been done that way before. Uh, and what's nice about this is that it shows you that it depends on where that river meets um, the coastal margin. So you can, you can meet that coastal margin on an active zone or a passive zone. And that really matters a lot because in an active zone, maybe Taiwan, you can have very, very rapid inputs during typhoons where you get lots of kerogen. Uh, ancient material, heavy weathering, you can get lots of modern material, you'll see large uh, assemblages of logs and, and, and trees and things like that after these typhoons. And of course, you still get modern phytoplankton. The other case would be maybe the Amazon, where you come from the Andes and you have this very, very broad floodplain where you have lots of material that can sit. So the residence time from the watershed to the coastal margin here is very short. Here, what happens is you have this longer residence time in the floodplain, and what happens is you, you, you essentially get this, it's modern material, but it's aging. And so you get this sort of in between the ancient and modern uh, that results at this aging uh, as it moves along down its path. And of course, much less uh, carrageen material, at least out here. It's not that you don't get carrageen inputs uh, from, from, from the Andes, if we're using the Amazon, to these immediate depositional areas. But out here, you start to get much, um, much less of that uh, making its way to the coast. So this, is, this was really a really nice figure. Uh, Tim Eglinton loves this one as well, uh, because it really brings in the larger spectrum of geological processes with carbon dynamics. Um, and then we just sort of, you know, there's lots of cartoons. I'm almost finished with my cartoon show. Um, but basically, the other one that we added to, to the mix here um, it, and, it, and it talks, it, it really looks at some of the locations where we're go I'm going to take you in this seminar. So these are some of the hot spots for what well, hot spots, what we call hot spots for carbon burial in the coastal margin. Um, we have mangroves and marshes. We'll talk a little bit about that. Deltaic systems, which, uh, as I've said, that goes far, as far back as what Berner was bringing up very early on. Here are the fjords and then permafrost regions, which are a whole different dynamic uh, when you get to the high latitudes, all the rules about carbon aging and availability change. It's a very, very different system. Uh, I won't be talking about upwelling systems. So um, the idea of a critical zone really uh, finds its origins more with the terrestrial community, where you can see here these axes, so they can look at atmosphere to lithosphere, and then they can look from minutes to eons. And as many of you know who, who uh, write proposals to NSF, um, this has taken on its own life uh, at, at NSF, and, and critical zones are a big uh, topic. And so um, this largely derives from the soil community, where they can carve out nice delineated regions uh, but in aquatic systems, it's a bit more difficult. So 
where are the where are the the zonations or or these critical zones in moving water and i'll talk to you about some of these as i said there are dams there are river confluences there are river plumes uh that show these kinds of demarcation that you might see in um in soils and what's interesting is that what i call to be biogeochemistry in the 21st century and uh, this brings me back to my roots in ecology and evolution. It's so nice to see a lot of the genetic uh, population uh, adaptation, evolution side of things being incorporated into the way we look at molecules and kinetics and things like that. That was just largely missing. Uh, some of it was because we, we just didn't have the right techniques, but some of it was just that there was a real divorce there as well because the, the people have been, uh, looking at, at those kinds of um, uh, ecological evolutionary adaptation things for many, many years. So I think this is really an interesting side of things with respect to uh, these, these new barriers we've created in the Anthropocene and how organisms are adapting from the microbial level up to metazoans. And this is just showing you some of those examples of really steep gradients in river confluences. You can see um, these extreme gradients of, of productivity and suspended sediment, how dams affect uh, where, we, where we slow down rivers and make them productive regions. And then the classic brown, green, blue, the brown, green, blue that we see off the big deltas, right? The, the highly turbid zones, uh, the green areas where you lose some of that turbidity and use up the nutrients and then out in the blue water, where you uh, have plenty of light and you lose the nutrients. So um, I'm not going to talk about this. I know this is one of Bob good, uh, one of Bob's favorite topics too, priming. Uh, there's some interesting priming that goes on in these regions. That's a whole separate talk. Um, 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 Bob and, and Kirk have a really cool paper that came out in, um, in, in a Frontiers special issue that we did uh, recently. And um, so I would, I would refer you to that. That's one of the, actually the most popular paper in that whole special issue, if you didn't know that, um, Bob. But so it's a really good one. Um, anyway, these are areas where you can have this interaction of very labile material. This might be algal DOC, uh, thereby enhancing terrestrial DOC, and then resulting in CO2 release. So this, how does this magic occurs? You know, this has been referred to for many years um in the literature and um in different ways and and I, we're finally starting to get down to some of the mechanisms of how the bacteria perform this uh because you can't just give bacteria a labile source and expect it to suddenly be able to degrade uh, or break down uh, aromatics in, in terrestrial materials so something else is going on in this transition and with the omics that are out there now we're able to sort of tease apart some of this but I'm not talking about it. I'm just saying that at these interfaces, this is an important process that can enhance, uh, in some cases, uh, the cycling rate where you have labile carbon coming in contact with refractory carbon. Okay, so that's section one. Section two, um, uh, these are some of the places that I'm going to take you. May, don't worry, this, this seminar is only like about 40 slides. Um, basically, th there'll be like maybe two slides a piece, so don't sweat that. Um, but I'll take you to places where we've looked at permafrost. I'll take you to places where we've looked at deltas uh, in China, in Mississippi, the ma marshes, mangroves, fjords, um, and fjords in New Zealand. So all of these different types of systems and, and what we can learn from them. So a little bit about the techniques, and I won't go into this in tremendous detail at all, but we use isotopes. Uh, bulk isotopes and biomarkers you'll be hearing about. Uh, some of the work we do is compound specific, where you actually can isolate particular compounds to do stable isotopic analysis or to do radiocarbon. It's a lot of work. Uh, and some of it is this ramp pyrolysis that I'll talk to you about uh, a little bit later, where we uh, basically heat up samples, you produce CO2, and that CO2 gets measured um, uh, for radiocarbon, and that's correlated with when it ramps off, when it comes off. In other words, when does it burn? Does it burn at a lower temperature or at a higher temperature? And that's usually related to lability and age. 
Uh, and then some of the biomarkers. Uh, again, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about the N-alkanes. Let's see, what else do we have here? Um, basically, uh, I'll be talking about lignin. Um, and let's see, I guess some fatty acids as well. I won't be talking about all of these, but just to show you some of the, the molecules that we'll be talking about that track uh, terrestrial carbon or certain types of soil carbon. A lot of these are very stable uh, uh, compounds compared to some of the other biomarkers out there. So here's the first bit of data. And this is an older paper that we had off the um, Mississippi, here's Southwest Pass. This is um, the northern uh, Gulf of Mexico, right? Uh, here's the Mississippi Canyon, and this is a transect coming out to the canyon. So the one thing I just wanna show you going back to 2008, it's a busy slide, but just look at these two lines here. Essentially, this one line is showing you the lignin concentration. Lignin is a, a, a biomarker for vascular plants. And so you see it higher in the near shore, no surprise, and then it decreases offshore, no surprise. So you might say, well, that's just dilution uh, if you're normalizing this to total organic carbon. Some of it is that, but some of it is in fact decay. This line going up is sort of the decay indices that we use for lignin. So this is showing you that lignin's de actually decomposing um, uh, subtidally. And, and most of the really heavy lignin uh, uh, breakdown occurs by fungi um, uh, because they evolved the ability to break open the, the ring structure. But what you get in these margin areas is you get these moieties of, of lignin that have been kind of broken down. And then by the time you get into the coastal waters, you have bacteria that can really go after lignin. Uh, they may not be doing what brown fungi do, but they're actually decomposing lignin. And this was something that was taboo years ago. It was never viewed that lignin could ever be broken down other than in, on land. Um, this is a schematic from uh, one of, I think, a paper with Bob and Brent. I don't have the reference for it, but um, uh, basically one of the interesting things that Bob knows a lot more about than I do is that, of course, in these... Uh, river dominated margins, uh, you have these mobile and fluid muds that you've heard about from Bob, I'm sure. And one of the really important things about uh, these, these muds is not only their ability to break things down because of their oxic uh, um, conditions and availability of electron acceptors and so on, but also their ability to transport material rapidly offshore. What we see in some of these areas is that, and I'm not going to show you the data, but you see lots of material that comes from right and around the mouth of the river getting transported to the canyon after some of these big storms as the water moves back out and drains the continent. Uh, mobile muds allow that to move offshore, but there are other things that mobile muds do. And we've looked at mobile muds in um, off of, uh, we've been working now in China for the past 10 years uh, uh, off the Changjiang uh, River. And these are mobile mud belts in here. These are just sort of the complex uh, currents in and around this area. But here's Shanghai. H here's, here's where uh, Changjiang comes out. Uh, yellow rivers up here. And what we did was we compared uh, uh, on deck uh, remineralization of soil, of, of sediment or organic matter in the mobile muds. And in this area that has been accumulated, this sort of distal path, depot center from eroded delta regions up here. So this is when the Yellow River had huge amounts of land loss. This was transported, and this is sort of a place where all of this material sits from the old delta. And you have all of these complex regions that have these different sedimentary regimes, different mixing regimes, different layers of fluid muds, uh, different steady state, non-steady state conditions, typical complexity that you find in any coastal margin, right? But interestingly, what you, if you look at sort of in, so you, you let the sediment cook on these, uh, in these incubators, and you look at this material that's been transported from the Yellow River Delta and sits here after it's been pretty well oxidized, and then you have this material that's getting fresh material, uh, from the plume as well as from the river in the mobile mud belts, 
And essentially we see that, you know, the incubation studies in the mobile muds were much higher than the percent loss of organic carbon in this sort of residual material that sits out here. So again, this is another way that we as humans change these hot spots, right? So a lot of the alteration of the Yellow River Delta and its instability was caused by humans um, over hundreds, actually thousands of years. And now you have this residual pool of sort of reworked age material that sits there, it's not very reactive. And then of course we have changes that we're making even in the length of this mobile mud belt because of the dams uh, upstream. So all of these different pools and different sedimentary regimes in, this, um, uh, in, these, in these coastal seas or marginal seas are really being impacted by uh, what's going on uh, in the Anthropocene. Now, this is a paper uh, that looks at many, many data sets you can see all these red regions are where we went into the literature. And we're, we're looking at um, carbon characteristics. This, these are sort of end members, right, of, of uh, C13 and uh, delt C14. These are just sort of end members to get your bearings. And this is what it looks like, you know, lots of things in between the pure uh, end members, which is common uh, in many cases. The one I just want to point out to you is this gray one. This, these are the Arctic regions, right? So notice the Del 14 negative being older. The Arctic uh, uh, material that you're seeing is really much, much older than what we see in a lot of the other regions. If you look at the uh, uh, Del uh, 13, um, it looks terrestrial in origin. And, and of course, this has gotten a lot of attention in recent years. Uh, a lot of this is related to the destabilization of the Arctic surface. And so we have rapid conversion of this, these layers of permafrost. And these layers, what's interesting about carbon in the Arctic that's very different than what I showed you before with this aging material or material that gets shunted in active and passive margins is that a lot of this was deposited in the Pleistocene and it was sort of flash frozen and it didn't go through this long-term decay. So as this material starts to thaw, we're getting ancient, not ancient, but material that's thousands of years old that's actually still very fresh in terms of its um, usability. And, and, and so that's not good for us because uh, aside from clathrates just going straight uh, to methane, you have this pool that can actually go through the microbial loop and be converted to um, CO2. And we did, um, it, it's kind of interesting because you start looking at this ancient carbon. So here's the Del 14, here's the bioavailability. Bio so look at this very old uh, uh, C14 material. The bioavailability of the DOC is very high. And so a lot of this gets in the food webs. And this is sort of counter to what you would find in many other places in the world. Old carbon that's been sitting around usually is not wanted by most heterotrophs. But you can have up in the Arctic now, gastrotrichs that have very short life cycles that are thousands of years old before they die. There are ducks floating around up there that are 8,000 years old because this material actually gets into their tissues through the food web that's kind of a different uh, a whole different angle um, from the from the food web perspective, but what's really the main point here is that the whole age continuum and usability of carbon changes in the Arctic. Uh, old can still be very very fresh. So if we continue on this, we did some work in the Colville Delta, and. Um, this is where we use the ramp pyrolysis. So if you look at these figures here, so here's the Colville Delta up here in, in Northern Alaska. This whole watershed is continuous permafrost. And we have soils that are collected from near the Delta surface soil uh, sediment. And then we have some in the um, drainage area, uh, deeper soil. And I'm just showing you too, we have other data. All right, so what we're trying to see is how much of this permafrost that's destabilizing in the watershed makes its way to the coast. Most of the DOC work shows that the DOC doesn't even make it to the coastline because it's so labile. 
So if you have permafrost DOC generated here, it gets transported through the river, it gets burned up typically in the river before it makes its way there. Not all of it, but a lot of it. What about the POC, which is what we were interested in? How much of this POC that's locked in these soils makes its way if it's labile? Well, if you look at the uh, ramp pyrolysis, this just shows you the thermograph, right? This is essentially the temperature. This is PCO2, that's these values here, right? This is how much CO2 burns off at 200. This is how much burns off at 600. And then this is the age of the carbon that you generate, the CO2. So the idea is that um, the earlier it comes off, the younger it is in terms of temperature. The later it comes off, the harder it is to burn and convert to CO2, the older the, 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 the C14 is, right? It's a very crude way of looking at bulk organic matter in terms of its lability and age. Here's the main point, is that this looks very much like this. This is taken from deep soils here, and this is taken from deltaic surface soils. And it looks like this material is getting transported pretty quickly during the high flow periods, but what's the mechanism of getting it into the river? Bank erosion. So these are what a lot, this is what happens with a lot of the, uh, these, this is a river here, the Achillic River, and you can see this massive bank erosion, lots of permafrost making its way into the river, and then it gets shunted to the coast pretty quickly. Okay, so that's uh, one way to um, take this relatively labile POC and keep it fairly similar uh, to what it was where it, it comes from in the soil to where you see it on the delta. This is another study that we've looked at. This is one of the few places in Louisiana uh, that is growing. Uh, most of Louisiana is, is, is eroding away. Again, we're in the Anthropocene, so this is a, what we call an embryonic delta. It's, it's decades old, and um, you can see essentially that um, this was formed as a result of an outlet that was made for flood relief. So again, this is as a result of, of human intervention, but it's a beautiful, I love the footprint of it. It's a beautiful delta, very sandy system. You can see we have actually a chrono sequence that you can look at. The older is 38 years old, 26 years old, 13 years old. We know exactly when this thing was formed. And this is what the surface looks like. So the, the 38 year old, the older material closer to the coast has some willow trees and vegetation. You start moving out to the mid area, you have lower plant material, and then you get out here. This is what most of the wax delta looks like, these big sandy areas. So we said this is really an interesting thing to look at because most of the deltas that we are dealing with are thousands of years old. What can we learn from this system uh, since we can actually see it happening before us in these sort of embryonic stages? So one of the things you see, and uh, this is just carbon stock, um, you can see that um, the highest carbon stock is where you would expect where the older sediments are. And then you get out in the sands, this, this is a lower amount of carbon stock in the, in the delta footprint. And of course, there's a relationship between depth, the organic carbon stock and depth, uh, mean low water. So again, uh, water depth, uh, vegetation, age, all of that, it, nothing earth shattering here, it makes sense um, in that regard. Uh, and this is just showing you a similar footprint um, except that one of the other things that we do see is the um, surface area uh, being very, very important in this. Because as I said, this is very coarse material. What you start to get is you start to get much finer material occurring where the vegetation is. Again, something we know, but very nice to see in this uh, natural laboratory. One of the other things uh, that we looked at, this is something at Laura, uh, Worman would certainly know more about than I do, uh, but basically the role of iron. And I said we would sort of talk about all those different things that I mentioned earlier. When we look at the carbon getting buried in this embryonic delta, about 15% of the organic carbon was bound to um, iron, reactive iron. The other thing that we've started to look at is with Mossbauer spectroscopy um, is that the ferrohydrite um, the dominant uh, iron oxide 
um, organic carbon was in the older, more vegetated sediments. In contrast to hematite, so right, so so we're looking at, you know, what types of iron minerals are associated uh, with this 15% number as you move across different regions of the delta. And I think the way we sort of preliminarily ex explain this is that the ferrohydrite, which in many cases is happening under lower redox, where you sort of get this um, iron two that migrates up to the surface and gets oxidized. Um, when the ferrohydrite forms, it actually precipitates DOC in the water. And that's one mechanism is sort of a co-precipitation in the older, uh, more anoxic sediments. Once you move out to the outer part of the delta, you're getting the outer extent of where the, the river inputs, these big flushes of soil get shut, shunted out. And that's more of a sorption mechanism. So this uh, with ferrohydrite would be more of a precipitation mechanism of trapping carbon. And the hematite, which we believe, if you look at some of the soils upriver, uh, is coming in from the soils and just getting transported out. It's not forming uh, through this redox. And, and that makes sense because this is out in the sandy area where, where you wouldn't have uh, iron two uh, migrating up and, and precipitating out. Another interesting aspect that we added to the literature that's been developing on, on um, carbon and iron is our biomarker uh, information. So we know that carbon uh, associates with these minerals, but what about the different types of carbon? So actually what we see here um, is essentially in the young region, the mid region and the old region of the Delta, all right? We see that the intermediate and the old region of the Delta um, is essentially uh, binding material, the young sites are preferentially bound during co-precipitation. So this, as I said, this is sort of trapping different pools of carbon, different types of lignin material. Lignin, let, let me say this again, some of the different lignins that are getting trapped during the co-precipitation are different uh, in, the, in the young site than, than, than uh, what you get in, in some of the, um, I'm sorry, in the old site compared to the young site where you have mostly um, uh, uh, um, sorption kinds of things going on. So again, um, it, it, it takes a while for me to explain this. All I, all I want you to get from this is that these, these sites here that have different redox than uh, the young site, which is uh, coarser material, more oxidized, you see shifts in the types of uh, selective compounds that are getting uh, included in that. So there is selective uh, preservation going on if you just look at a particular group of, of uh, compounds. Okay, now this gets to where we talk about the fjords. Um, we estimated, you know, based on lots of numbers that we gathered, that about 11% of all of the marine carbon burial uh, in the ocean is in fjords, which was really shocking to us. And it may still be wrong, um, but basically, if you look at this, um, this shows that the total organic burial of oceanic uh, with sediment type, this is uh, non-deltaic, all of these systems that we started off the, the lecture with, right, that, that get divided into these different pools. So if you look at the total burial um, uh, in grams of carbon per square kilometer per year, the fjords are not as high as delta and non-delta, just simply based on their small footprint. But when you area normalize that, that's when the fjords suddenly really appear. So uh, again, not surprising, it's a very small footprint on the planet, uh, but boy, do they store lots of material. And, um, it, and it does depend, it depends on the fjord. Not all fjords are the same. And that's one of the things we are resolving uh, some really bury much, much more efficiently than others. So that's certainly a fair argument. When we were down in, in New Zealand, uh, in Fjordland, a, a beautiful area, um, these are some of the fjords we looked at going from uh, north to south. Uh, and there's an interesting gradient here. Over here, the northern fjords are really steep and rainy area. The rain in this area gets up to six meters per year and very, very steep slopes. 
lots of landslips and landslides. As you start moving to the southern part of the, the fjordland, you get a much more gradual view. The fjord views are not nearly as nice as they are up here. So how does that affect what ultimately gets put into the fjords in terms of storage? Well, if you look at the fraction modern, based on radiocarbon numbers, this is doubtful sound, which is in the north. This is dusky sound, which is in the middle. And this is long sound, which is south. So very steep, intermediate, and much more of a graded and, and less, um, less um, rainfall. So what we see in the sediments of the fjords is essentially that um, um, in, in, in the fraction modern, in the really steep areas, we have a lot of material that's very modern. Bulk material, lignin phenols are modern. This is the, the radiocarbon uh, compound specific work. Uh, and the long chain fatty acids are modern. Now you move to the intermediate areas, the slope changes a little bit, a little less rainfall. So here we're seeing a fast rapid injection, high rainfall, lots of landslips and more um, uh, earthquake activity as well. So you get a rapid injection of material that's pretty modern. As you start moving down to here and you change and you hold on to the material longer in the drainage basin, you start to get older material in the fjords. So it's just, it's just again, as a result of a gradient of rainfall, steepness, and, and tectonic activity, where once you get down here, you start getting very old uh, long chain fatty acids and old, older uh, uh, fraction modern. Now, if you compare uh, New Zealand fjords here to, let's say, the Washington coast, um, Yellow River, Pan Arctic regions, you can see the New Zealand fjords are pretty fresh lots of modern material. That's not going to be typical of many, many other regions. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that. So fjords in New Zealand have a lot of fresh material that's making its way in. Granted, different uh, gradients of that as you go from north to south. What happens if you go to southeast Alaska, southwest Alaska, southeast Alaska, I was right. Um, and you look at that. Well, this is a whole different uh, game now. We have some fjords that have glaciers and some that do not. And we compared the fjords in the glaciated and non-glaciated. And here we have a mixing model of, this is going to be the material in the fjord. These are just different, set, different stations. Uh, this is the organic carbon accumulation rate. And these different colors are the uh, different types of carbon. So in the non-glaciated, we see mar uh, mostly marine, okay? In the glaciated, we see mostly petrogenic material. Um, and so um, a lot more material getting buried in the uh, glaciated fjords. So these, these fjords are bulldozing old material into the fjord. But one of the interesting things about this is that, what does that mean with respect to, um, if, with respect to sequestration? And what I mean by that is that you can have places where you have a tremendous amount of petrogenic material that gets buried, but it's essentially not interacting with the atmosphere. It's radiocarbon dead. Uh, and for that transport, that rapid transport, once it makes its way in here, it's essentially going to be buried. Uh, this paper by Blattman et al, this is one, was one of Tim Eglinton's students um, who did some very nice work looking at the different types of organic material and its, its, its association with mica uh, uh, and chloride and then smectite over here. Um, and so here you have more of the, the pedogenic, the soil material that's coming in. Um, and that essentially comes in, uh, is more modern um, and actually, not only just more modern, but also uh, essentially dislodges from the mineral. Here, this stays bound. So there's two reasons why this just doesn't interact with the atmosphere. It's radiocarbon dead, and it's also really strongly bound. This material, uh, it, it's, it allows, it's, it comes off the material once it goes into a different ionic strength water, but it also actually allows for that material to be de uh, decomposed and potentially produce CO2. So um, 
So again, when you look at just the numbers of burial in certain systems, it depends in terms of, of, of your interest in how, what that means to global warming. Uh, this, all these different pools are coming in. Some of them are interacting with microbes and interfacing with fluxes, and some of it is just getting buried. Now, I started to think about the, um, the whole idea of retreat, glacial retreat. And one of the things I became interested in was that as you start to retreat glaciers, um, that's one thing. Of course, it changes what flows in, nutrients, and so on. But one of the things that I became interested in was you start opening up new, what I would call these aquatic, a new aquatic critical zone. So this material, uh, this glacier was here, uh, subtitled, dumping lots of material in. Once it starts to retreat, you now create a platform and you enhance the residence time. So this gets into the, 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 what the, the, um, the previous active passive margin idea only on a micro scale. So as we start retreating glaciers, there's lots of reasons to worry about that in terms of, of water and all of that. But this is interesting in terms of, of the reactivity and residence time of material making its way from the glacier into the fjord. So one of the places, in fact, we're writing a proposal, Kirk and uh, Laura and some other folks, um, to maybe go up and, and take a look in Svalbard at some of these questions. Uh, but one of the interesting things, of course, is you get these little deltaic regions uh, that are left behind as, as the glacial retreat. So this is where the glacier was in 1948, um, one of the glaciers up in, in Svalbard. And you can see the years that it retreated. And here's where it's moving. But you get in these sort of residual deltaic regions that are left behind. So I'm starting to think, you know, is there a place we can go and look for this where we can compare it to um, rapid input with steep gradients and maybe a platform that's been left behind from the last glacial maximum? And sure enough, if you go to Fjordland, um, this is essentially a relic delta from the, about 17,000, 14,000 years ago. And I said, well, if we look here, most of the fjords, most of the fjord area in New Zealand is steep gradients. Maybe this is sort of like what we're going to be getting in the future, more of these platforms. So I would predict that the decay because of the resonance time would increase here compared to organic matter being shunted there. This is what most of Fjordland looks like, very, very steep. Uh, and very shallow soils. So sure enough, uh, and of course there are lots of other variables, but if you take the same kind of organic matter and you shunt it to the deep fjord here, it's very fresh in the bottom of the fjord. If you put it through this system here, the acid to aldehyde ratio or the decay of the lignin of the material coming through, uh, this is the Camelot River that drains through here, it's very, very different than what comes down. Same kind of material, but again, the residence time. So I think this is sort of a modern example of what we may be seeing uh, with, deglaci with, with the deglaciation and retreat of fjords. Um, one of the other final things I'll mention here uh, with, with, with respect to um, um, carbon storage is we've been also looking at some of the fjords in Scotland. And I'll just sort of uh, cut to the chase here. Uh, and basically, when you look at um, all of the carbon stored in the peatlands, metric tons of carbon per square meter, and you look at all the carbon stored in fjords in Scotland, and um, this light blue is inorganic carbon, the dark blue is organic carbon. So just look at these two values, and you'll see that there's a difference, there's an order of magnitude difference in the scale. So the scale of the, uh, it looks like the organic carbon of the, the peatlands is taller or, or more than what you see in the fjords, but this is an order of magnitude higher. So amazingly enough, when you look at what we know about the, the fjords in Scotland, they seem to be actually storing more than the peatlands uh, based on, on at least these numbers. Uh, Craig Smith, published that. 
Okay, the final section, a few more slides and I'm finished. Um, marsh mangrove aquatic criti critical zones. Um, we know that blue carbon has gotten its fair share of attention, I think way more than it deserves, but nevertheless, I've uh, been a part of some of it. Uh, and the idea of this blue carbon, and for those of you who don't know what that is, it's, it's basically marshes, mangroves, and seagrasses. And so there's been lots of numbers put on the economic value of this because of the sequestration uh, of high sequestration and carbon burial efficiency of these systems. And that's not new. We've known that for many, many years. It just has taken on this new name of blue carbon in the context of global warming. Uh, but the marsh people would tell you that they've known that for many, many years going back to the 60s. Um, so again, it's just sort of the context in which it's being presented. One of the interesting things, and this relates to the paper that Jeff and, and Bob uh, are on that, that I talked about that we have uh, in review with the Journal of Anthropocene, is that organisms are migrating uh, on land, uh, in water, everywhere uh, towards the poles in, in massive numbers. So aside from the extinction problem, uh, we have organisms on the move in a big way. One of the places where we've been seeing this that's very, very evident is in the Gulf of Mexico. And we worked a little bit in Texas, but we're now working in Florida. So what's happening is that mangroves are moving north because the freezes are less intense. And the mangroves, actually, you can now see uh, mangroves up making their way into uh, Georgia. Um, and so, but the hot spots are still pretty much around here, about mid Florida is where the really heavy zone of mangrove uh, invasion is. So what does this have to do with what we're talking about? Well, number one, blue carbon is a hot spot area in the near shore region, but it also relates to this migration, uh, animal, plant, and so on. What does that mean with respect to carbon burial? That's not been really given the attention. This is a hard slide to see, but these are our two study sites, St. Augustine, Wakasasa Bay. Um, and this just shows uh, what these areas look like where you have mangrove and marsh transitions. This is um, basically St. Augustine side. This is the Wakasasa side, uh, not very easy to see. But here's the main message, or here's the main point is that if you look at carbon burial in pure mangrove, right, on one side, and then you go to the transition zone on both coasts, like, you know, you look essentially, uh, you have three zones where the mangroves are, the intermediate zone where, where they're uh, combined, and then a little bit north of that would be just marsh. And basically, in almost in all the situations on both coasts, you find that the transition zone where you find mangrove and marsh coexisting is where you have the highest burial rates. So that's fine. Um, there's lots of work going on with this, but it's been very plant centric. And it's all been uh, governed by uh, or, or uh, examined by people looking at nitrogen dynamics, looking at a whole variety of different plant ecology kinds of things. So one of the things that has come out of this paper uh, that I keep making reference to that I'll, I'll put the title and, and authors in just another minute, is that what also is happening in Florida is that the crabs are moving. So there are mangrove crabs that are moving with their host species. That's not been taken into consideration by the plant-centric community. When I go out and I talked to the people who've worked at this. I said, do you ever look at the bentho? And they said, no, we don't look at that. We're just primarily looking at nutrients, uh, root depth, uh, above, below ground, biomass, so on. So what's happening is that you have fiddler crabs that are dominating in the seagrasses. And then what's coming with the mangroves, which has been totally ignored, as I said, are these deeper burrowing mangrove crabs. So when you start getting into comparing the efficiency of mangroves versus marshes, you can't just look at the root above and below ground root biomass and so on. Uh, there are these other factors. So if you now, if you have deeper burrowing mangrove crabs, obviously you've potentially changed uh, the oxygen mixing in these systems uh, well below what the 
typical burrowing depth of the fiddler crabs are. I mean, these, these, some of these other crabs go down a meter or so. Uh, and, and, and so, um, so that is sort of um, a prelude to this, where we have all of these folks uh, in this paper. And what we do in this paper is we talk about um, a much broader view of that example that I just talked about in Florida. In other words, what this means as we have organisms migrating towards the poles, what does it mean uh, on the coastal margin where we have this huge reserve of carbon from the shelf into the estuaries? What does it mean if you start changing sort of the equilibrium or sort of stable late successional stage community of suspension deposit feeders to something very different? And we see, you know, there are major changes in where the lobsters are moving north. We're seeing changes in snow crab move north the more I talk to people. And they're saying they do see changes in areas, particularly muddy areas, that are being turned up more, that may not have been turned up before, which means that you may be taking carbon reserves that have been preserved pretty well. And now you're essentially opening it up to different newcomers passing through uh, that are re-oxidizing this. So my final thoughts are that um, the changes in bioturbation from range expansion may be something that I think uh, may be happening in, in, a, in an important way. The soil people certainly see it. If you look at some of the migration pathways of organisms moving on land, uh, ungulates and mammals and things like that, you can see the soil turnover rate of carbon is changing with different uh, mixing patterns from um, um, uh, mammals that are, are changing their pathway. Same kind of thing for benthos. Um, the the deglaciation and residence time idea, you know, as you start to get more vegetation growing in these new footprints uh, that are being created by the glacier that it leaves behind, uh, well, how does that change the amount of petrogenic carbon uh, vegetation uh, and the residence time at which that material gets processed compared to when it was sitting as a tidal glacier dumping in uh, large amounts of petrogenic material. What does that mean uh, for carbon storage in those systems? Uh, certainly the land use change uh, with uh, uh, dams and, and regional precipitation, all of these things that we talk about and think about all the time are things that we continue to change in what I consider to be these aquatic critical zones. Um, and then essentially, I think range expansion um, needs, needs more work. Um, I mean, it's kind of related to what I was saying here, but I, I think that this is really an interesting thing. Uh, Jeff knows more about this than I do on uh, people in ecology and evolution, but one of the other really interesting twists on this, and of course, the, the, the range expansion is being looked at by biodiversity people and ecology people, and I'm pointing out the, the impact it has with respect to physical mixing and storage. But one of the other really interesting things about it is that whether the organism stays, uh, migrates, or goes extinct, and um, you know, so it gets into sort of the current phenotypic plasticity that that organism um, uh, has from its current genes, or do you start to see changes? And there are papers now that are coming out with very divergent species, invertebrates and, and fish, uh, in some of these really steep gradients like the Gulf of Maine, the warmest uh, coastal warming body in the world, where you see really steep gradients and, and certain enzymes and genetic markers that show organisms adapting uh, or showing sort of a genetic climb of adaptation to that particular temperature across very divergent groups. So um, these are big selective forces that we're um, creating through these new uh, aquatic uh, critical zones. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Uh, I think we can uh, take questions now. I, uh, I don't know, can you see the raised hands or? Uh, Hang on. Under participants. Um, let me get out of the, um, I, I, I can just see that Jeff Leventon raised his hand. Yeah, well don't ask him. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm just kidding. Jeff, go ahead. That could um, be true. I, I wanted to add something. I'm, I'm wondering if you've considered the issue of sea level rise. And mm -hmm. the reason why I mention it is it has two very interesting effects. One is it might affect the flow of carbon in river systems in the tropics, but also it's kind of the opposite of the, of the Pleistocene because what's happening is the sea level is rising and also glaciers are retreating, which is the opposite of the Pleistocene. So, and I wonder if that might affect uh, carbon burial and erosion and so on. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, that's a great point, Jeff. And I think it's a really interesting um, comparison um, to earlier times. Um, that physical uh, dimension of the rising uh, sea level that I did not talk about in the coastal margin is a huge factor that some people have brought up. I mean, one of the other things aside from erosion is the um, uh, water logging um, and also the amount of submergence and association with, um, with lower oxygen conditions. Um, and people are starting to look at that a little bit. Um, another thing that we have looked at, I'll mention this, and this may not be getting exactly at what you're talking about, but in Florida, one of the really cool things that's happening is that as seawater starts to come in, it, it disaggregates fresh water formed peats and the peats start decomposing and produce this tea-like material and, you know, DOM. And so what's happening is that as you get sea level rise in Florida, you're seeing more and more plumes of tea material that's bleeding from these old peat deposits. And that's moving out into the coastal waters. So that's another loss of carbon from land that's being exported as DOM. Uh, that's a result strictly of the um, sea level rise. That's a huge uh, factor in um, where carbon's getting transported and burned. Um, but the other than that, Jeff, I can't say I really, we've explored that very well. I, I just think that's a really good point. That's the only thing I really have um, that we've sort of acknowledged in, in the work that we do. Um, and, and, and the only other thing I'll just say is that in Florida, the effect of sea level rise on the East Coast is impacting the, inter, the marsh mangrove interface more than on the West Coast because the West Coast is so shallow and and it has a much i mean if you if you can think of a difference in steepness in florida if that even exists that's kind of funny to think about a, a change in gradient in florida but actually the east coast is a steeper gradient than the um than the, the gulf coast and so um the effects of sea level rise on the gulf side are much less than what we're seeing on the east coast and and again you can see that with the gradients that's okay, the only place we brought it in. Great talk, Tom. Yeah, thanks. So, um, Tom, I, I have a question. I don't see any other raised hands at the moment. So, um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about or give your opinion about how dams, major dam systems, may be refocusing storage sites for carbon in uh, river systems where they would otherwise be in delta in the delta uh, yeah. regions and if you if you're if you have a system like the three gorges dam where you're refocusing you know 50 60 70 percent of the sediment into a reservoir that's on land as opposed to the oceans what are the what's the implication of that for carbon storage as you see it yeah no, that's, that's a good question, Bob, and, and that's one of the major hiccups in the aquatic continuum uh, are dams, and they just continue to grow in many of these areas, as many of us know, South America, China, and so on. Uh, and so one of the sort of the low-hanging fruits that we know about this is that it's an easy one to figure out is that, you know, when you hold the water back, you let the particles sink out, you take nutrient-rich water and you allow phytoplankton to grow. So brown rivers go to green. And, and, and so that changes the, um, uh, the availability of carbon compared to soil carbon that would normally be flushing through the river. So, so what oceanographers always viewed about years ago is that rivers just transport everything right to the shelf and nothing's going or right to the coast and nothing's happening in the river. That may be true in some rivers, but now it's true in less rivers. 
of, of those rivers because you have these hot spots now that are allowing for priming to occur uh, where this green material comes uh, in, in contact with this brown muddy water uh, and you, you allow for this potential priming effect, uh, which again is a complicated story. Uh, so, I, uh, so these areas behind these dams now uh, are getting lots of attention in terms of um, their sources of, 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 well, not only as sinks, but also sources of greenhouse gases. So um, while you may make it a sink in some ways by increasing uh, primary production uh, and enhance the breakdown of, of terrestrial material, um, there's also evidence that there's lots of uh, methane coming out of these systems when these dams are opened up from the bottom waters. Uh, and they sort of burp out this, this methane once they, with these opening and closing. And the final thing I'll mention that is, you know about more than I do, that a lot of people look at these dam reservoirs as lakes, and, and they're really not. There are uh, deltas coming into these reservoirs that are very different uh, than just sort of the lake bottom. And so when you go fishing around in their cores and you start looking at where the sediments are and what sediments are storing carbon, it's not like a lake. Uh, you, you see, depending upon the rivers coming in, uh, interesting gradients, not only with sediment size and, and sorting like that, that you would expect, but also types of carbon there. Hmm. Interesting. Let me just look and see if there's any more hands or people want to jump in. Maybe everyone's eating. <laughs> Hopefully that wasn't too much. Well, it was a great talk. It was certainly wide ranging and, uh, and, and touched on extremely, I think, topical problems that are facing, facing us and that are incredibly important. Um, and thank you for that. Thank you for an excellent talk. And so, um, For those uh, who might hang around and have questions and want discussions, do so. But I think that uh, we want to thank you. And uh, Shep, were you going to say something? You appeared on my screen. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say hello to Tom. Uh, uh, I enjoyed your talk very much. You and I have met and sort of know each other through Tim Philly, who uh, thinks the world of you, and he's has sent uh, his regards to you through me. Uh, yeah, I, I think we can both, we can all see that you're doing very well. So that was a great talk. Really thank, enjoyed thank, Thanks very much. Nice to see you, Paul. Right. Thanks. So the, the, the formal talk then will we'll bring to an end, and uh, for students and others who might want to hang around and uh, just uh, discuss things with Tom, you can do so. And uh, but at this point, I think that, that our colloquium, as such, it, we bring it to an end. And thanks again, Tom. Sure. Thank you.